go, Miss Lily. Are you ready? Are you giving the talk today? Look at it. Are you giving the talk today? Are you giving the talk? You're in the wrong spot. There you go. Okay. Yeah, All right. Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. Uh, lots to talk about, uh, unfortunately, this week. We have to constantly be worried about what's going on in the rest of the world because that's where all the variants are being produced. Uh, once again, uh, South America, Argentina is bad, Namibia, Tunisia, uh, Mongolia. Unfortunately, the United Kingdom and Spain are also seeing an uptick. Uh, there's been some really interesting data from Israel. Uh, Israel now has about 85% of the population vaccinated, so they're doing very, very well. And they got the case number down to almost, uh, you know, five, six, seven cases a day. Well, in June, it jumped up to 100 a day. Uh, and so they started vaccinating everyone between 12 and 15 years old because right now it's looking like most of those cases are in young people and the few remaining adults are unvaccinated. And what you're seeing that, uh, worldwide, actually, is the trend is that COVID is now infecting kids, mostly, and the people who are unvaccinated. And if you look at the Israeli distribution, it's really quite interesting because most of the cases are between 10 and 19 years of old. The second biggest group is between zero and nine. And very few, but a few cases remaining in the unvaccinated adults. So what about the US? The US, we're seeing an uptick. We look just like the United Kingdom and a little bit like Israel. We got really flat, and now we're seeing a pretty significant spike upward. Uh, if you look at cases doubled, they went from 12,000 to 25,000 nationally each day. Hospitalizations have gone up by 20%. Death rate is up by 17%. And we still have less than half of the country vaccinated. And so when you look at where are the hot spots, it's not really much different. It's Missouri, Arkansas, Colorado, Wyoming. And as I've said all along, you know, I was asked by my sister, when are things going to get back to normal? Well, I said in some places that are high, highly vaccinated, life will look pretty normal. But in those states where they're not highly vaccinated, they're going to continue to have flares. And that is exactly what's happening in the United States. And the Delta variant has just taken over. Delta is now uh, well over 60% of all of the viruses. You can see a huge spike in the Delta virus. And that's just because it's being selected for. It's more infectious than the UK variant, even more infectious than the UK variant. All the while, this is what's happening to our vaccination rate. It's dropping like a stone. And we just have a, too many people who are resistant to getting vaccinated, and we still have you know, 50 to 60 million kids under the age of 12 that need to be vaccinated. So if you look at the risk levels, like what's the riskiest place? <laughs> I wouldn't go to Missouri for anything. I had, a, I had one of our viewers, uh, who was living in St. Louis said, what should I do? And I said, well, <laughs> just stay at home. Uh, Arkansas is bad, but a lot of the South, you know, uh, Alabama and Mississippi still are bad, Louisiana. There's one county in Alabama that reported that 95% of the deaths in June were from COVID. Huge amount of COVID still around. So if we turn to our friends at the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation at uh, Washington University, I'm sorry, at University of Washington in Seattle, they're predicting it looks like there's going to be a, a, a fourth wave. Now, it may not be huge, but it's going to, we're seeing it. We're seeing an increase in cases. And, you know, you were hoping, I was hoping, you know, because it's summer, things will go down. Well, it's the vaccination. It's a battle between the virus being so infectious and people needing to get vaccinated. And vaccinations continue to work. In our local TMC data, very interestingly, we're seeing the same thing. Our, our number is now suddenly over one. It had been under one for weeks. You know, remember over one, the virus is winning. Under one, we're winning. Well, the virus is back in charge. It's up to 1.58. Our test positivity rate's gone back up to 4%. Our case number, you know, went from 133. I was feeling pretty good about it. You know, I said I, I'd start feeling good when it was at 40. It was back to 400. So we're seeing increased number of cases. And of course, not surprisingly, an increase in the number of hospitalizations, jumped up to 58 a day last week. So what is all this impact on, on having to do with the impact on our life expectancy? Well, you know, we're not so good as a country. Uh, I mean, you know, we're great as a country, but on this life expectancy thing, 
uh, we are not all that great. So if you look at the top 10, Hong Kong, Japan, Switzerland, Singapore, Italy, we're not up there. We're number, we're number 46 in life expectancy, just behind our friends in Cuba. They're 45th. Well, why is that? How can that be? You know, we all get to go to the hospital anytime we want. Well, it's because of the tremendous disparity in healthcare in the United States. We have uninsured people. Uh, we have poor people who don't have the same access to health care. That's standard. That's, that shows all the time. And the World Health Organization has published data on disparities in, in health care. We know that already. But what has the impact of COVID been? Well, it has been dramatic and has really shown the disparity in the United States. So relative to our peer countries, you know, the gap between where we are in, in, life, in life expectancy and where they are just increased by another five years. So huge change in our ability to, to survive as Americans rel relative to our other Western countries. But it's not, it's not even that distributed fairly. It's a uh, loss of four years in Hispanic, loss of 3.25 years in blacks, only a loss of 1.3 years in whites. So while it's had a big impact, it's been a terribly damaging effect uh, in uh, Hispanic community and the black community. And if you look at, to at just the number of deaths over time in, t in Texas, it's very interesting. You can see, you know, it varies each year. And these little spikes are years where we have a particularly bad flu epidemic or outbreak. But look at COVID. This is what COVID has done to deaths in Texas. So if you don't think it's had an impact, I mean, it's, it's had a dramatic impact. Lily, what are you scratching my leg for? <laughs> Unbelievable. Uh, anyway, so really interesting, a uh, couple of interesting studies. I know you're interested in this one, so listen up, Lily. Uh, this the publication is in, uh, in New England Journal looking at the uh, data from the corona vaccine. Uh, this is a Chinese company, Sinovac, that has a, a, <laughs> has a, a killed vaccine. Uh, and this was the one, remember last week we talked about that wedding where two people from India came over, had had the corona vaccine, and one of them, and they both had Delta virus, and one of them died. Well, this is the data from the efficacy data from corona vaccine. And they took a whole country, Chile, and they looked at 10.2 million people. They administered the, the corona vax uh, in two different doses. I'm sorry, in two, in two doses, uh, separated by 28 days. And they looked at the efficacy, and it was 65% effective in preventing COVID uh, and 90% effective uh, in preventing uh, ICU admissions and 86% effective in preventing death. Well, the interesting thing is when we say it's 65% effective and 90% effective, it's not 100%. And you could tell these people last week who came to the wedding had been, had been vaccinated with CoronaVac, and they both came in and got sick with Delta virus. So it's not 100%. Lancet had a follow-up study looking at uh, 3 to 17-year-olds uh, with CoronaVac, and they just basically did a phase 1-2 trial, looked at, at, at uh, tolerance and tolerability and efficacy in terms of generating neutralizing antibodies. And what they showed was that uh, it works in that age group, 3 to 17, 97% uh, developed neutralizing antibodies. About 25% had adverse reactions, but they were, you know, local mild uh, reactions to the, to the injection. Uh, but I'm not really sure how to do it because China has already approved it for kids over three years old. I guess they did that without the data. Now they have the data, so they published the data. That's kind of backwards. Usually you're supposed to get the data, publish it, get it approved. They approved it. It's like, never mind. You're supposed to look at data before you approve it, but they approved it anyway. So uh, the, the other interesting thing in vaccine news, Pfizer has requested the FDA approve them for a third dose, a booster dose. Now, <laughs> where do they? I think this is jumping the gun a little bit. The CDC has shown that it's still effective for two doses. Uh, the company said, well, you know, the vaccine, the uh, antibody levels wane over, over six to eight months, which is true, and the efficacy drops from 90 to 85 percent, still very effective. But you remember the papers we reviewed a couple of weeks ago? <laughs> They're very effective at maintaining B cell immunity for a long, long time. In fact, most of the publications suggest you won't need a booster for maybe year two or even more. We may need a booster for sure, maybe, we may, but that right now, so I'm, I'm really kind of surprised by that. The data don't, the data don't really support that. Uh, one other sort of problem with the vaccine, Johnson & Johnson has seen uh, that with their vaccine, the adenoviral vector vaccine, there have been some cases of Guillain-Barre. Now Guillain-Barre is that you know, ascending uh, neurologic disease where you get loss of uh, feeling, sometimes paralysis. 
usually self-learning goes away, but it can be, you know, it's a pretty significant um, complication. There have been fewer than 100 cases reported in 12.8 million uh, vaccines. So it's still approved, but John, they'll have a warning uh, for Guillain-Barre on that for sure. And then this was a really fascinating study published in Nature this last week. Uh, these investigators isolated a Delta strain uh, virus from travelers coming from India. And the first thing they showed was that the monoclonal antibodies that we infuse early on, they're totally ineffective against the Delta strain. That means the spike protein has changed enough where the monoclonal antibodies don't recognize this, that part of the spike pro protein on the Delta virus. But they took a sera from 162 patients and tested whether or not they were still effective at neutralizing uh, that virus. And it's three to fourfold less potent at neutralizing than neutralizing the alpha or UK variant. But it's still very effective. So 95% effective at neutralizing, just at a lower titer. This is the key point. They looked at individuals had just either AstraZeneca vaccine or just one dose of the Pfizer, not complete, just one dose. And both of those had no effect in neutralization. So that first dose that you get for Pfizer and Moderna, it raises your antibodies levels high, but you need that extra boost to manage Delta. It, they're not, the first dose is not high enough to actually neutralize the Delta virus. So for the 10% of people who got their first dose and are going like, I don't think I'll get the second dose, you're totally exposed to the Delta virus. That's a really important message. You need both doses. You need both doses to have your antibodies high enough so even the Delta virus is managed. Even though it's less effective than managing the other ones, it, uh, you're at two doses, it's still very effective against the Delta virus. And then another really great study in Nature this last week, this, this, this set of investigators figure out what, how, the mechanism of the vaccine-induced immune thrombocyto, uh, thrombotic thrombocytopenia. Remember, we were talking about those few people, like 30 or 40 cases in the world's literature, people who had low platelet counts and clotting, mostly it was in the European cohort, uh, associated with the adenoviral vaccines. That's J Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So it turns out heparin does this because there is a platelet factor that's responsible for clotting, and heparin antibodies, heparin generates antibodies that bind to this platelet factor four they cause it to clump, and then that induces a clotting cascade. So these investigators looked at the antibodies generated by the adenovirus vector uh, and found out they mapped it to just eight amino acids, but exactly in that heparin binding domain, exactly in that same domain. So it, it, what it does is those antibodies that are generated by the adenoviral vector bind exactly to the same place that heparin does. In fact, heparin competes away, can compete away from platelet factor four and induces exactly the same kind of thing that heparin-induced uh, thrombotic thrombocytopenia does. So very interesting, Matt figured it out that there are antibodies generated that bind to that heparin domain, uh, heparin binding domain on, on uh, platelet factor four. So very, very good. And then one final really cool paper. This is my, my favorite of the week. Uh, you know, everyone's complaining, you know, are debating about where did the virus come from? You know, was it made in the lab? Did people, you know, the lab, and, lab accident, let it get out? So let's, think a little bit about the timeline here. So you remember uh, SARS was reported in Wuhan right at the end of December of 2019. And the first two cases were reported in January in Rome. And the first documented case, confirmed lab, uh, laboratory case, was in Lombardy, Italy in February 20th, uh, February in 2020. So December 2019, February 2020. So these investigators in Italy were doing a different study, had nothing to do with COVID. And they looked at serum from 959 people who were enrolled in a lung cancer screening program. So they were just drawing blood from people to look for lung cancer markers from September 1990, I mean, se se September 2019 to March 2020. And they found antibodies to coronavirus in 111, 11% starting in September 2019. And then there was another cluster in February after the uh, Lombardi got really bad. So the virus was circulating in Italy in September. Now, we're, to focus on the lab accident in December misses the whole point. This thing was around for a long time. It just wasn't as infectious. And then it became more and more infectious. And you're seeing what's happening now. It continues to evolve and get more infectious. So I think this at least shows that in Europe, it was there in September, and probably in China was there long before. So I think the origin is that it came out of the, <laughs> it's naturally occurring. It just started getting worse and worse and worse. Anyway.
Now time for our Olympic report. I love Japan. What, what a disaster. There's always a new country to take over, you know, what's most messed up in the world. So they're trying to get more people vaccinated. They've, they've vaccinated 52 million doses. Unfortunately, that's only 15% of the population. And so you think about it compared to the U.S. or U.K., we're at 50%. They now have 820,000 confirmed cases in Japan. And they're starting a fourth wave. They're ticking up. So, you know, they're, they're in the middle of a fourth wave. Meanwhile, the Olympics are starting. Uh, so, you know, they put, they've declared an emergency from now until the end of the Olympics on August 22nd. It's funny, they've now said that no one in Tokyo or the surrounding prefectures can actually attend. So they're, including their national stadium that they just built for 68,000 people will be empty through the whole thing. Uh, they can't, they're canceling the, or at least no one's attending the opening and closing ceremonies, track and field and swimming events. You know, and those unfortunately are what the events that Lily's best at, you know, so we're a little upset about that. But she's good, she can perform even without an audience, so it'll be fine. Uh, and another great thing is uh, uh, they have sold 4.5 million tickets and everybody's asking for their money back. So it's, it's going to be unbelievable. So we're looking forward to that great super spreader event known as the Tokyo Olympics. That will be coming up soon. And Lily is off to the Olympics soon. Uh, I, think you're, I think we're hoping to get some events on tape. If we're lucky, we'll get to see her perform, not in person, but safely at a distance. Uh, but anyway, we're looking forward to the Olympics, and I want everybody to have a great time this weekend, and I will see you next week. United States of America. Pulls up very quickly, but Colonel Jojo is led early. A big winner. Stick this dismount.